So we're going to start out by asking Kim to swear in um, anyone from uh, Grace who is going to be uh, providing uh, testimony this morning. Good morning. Can you hear us? We can. Okay, great. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. And would you please state your name? Hi, good morning. This is Doug DeVello, President and CEO of Grace Cottage. And Stephen Brown, CFO. And Doug, whenever you're ready, you can proceed. Sure, great. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for allowing us to present today. And um, uh, we'll, we'll try and get through this as expeditiously, ex expeditiously as possible so that we can all uh, have lunch at a reasonable hour. Um, I want to start off by, by saying that, uh, that you know, Grace Cottage is, uh, is an organization that, that's, I'm sure, extremely well known to uh, the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, since 1949, we've uh, been delivering health care uh, to the residents of Townsend in southern Vermont uh, with a, a human and personal touch. Uh, our culture of caring, uh, combined with uh, our knowledgeable and skilled uh, team of providers and nursing staff, has really uh, enabled us to um, provide exceptional care uh, while achieving simultaneously really, really high patient satisfaction scores. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, uh, we were recognized as a top 20 critical access hospital uh, in the United States for patient satisfaction by the National Rural Health Association, uh, it's something we're, we're really uh, quite proud of. And uh, because of our size and our independence uh, and our collective sense of duty, we, uh, we're, we're able to uh, provide our patients with a very high degree of individual attention that uh, uh, compared to what one might find at a, at a larger, more complex healthcare organization. Uh, we're a 19-bed critical access hospital, as all of you know. Uh, we run an average daily census of between 10 and, and 14 patients, uh, and that fluctuates uh, rather dramatically over the course of the year. Um, we uh, have uh, a 24-7 emergency de department that sees uh, roughly 27 to 2,800 visits uh, annually. We have a, a diagnostic imaging department with uh, x-ray and CT scanning capabilities, uh, as well as bone densitometry. We uh, have a... Uh, a laboratory that provides uh, approximately 40,000 outpatient tests per year and approximately 6,000 inpatient tests per year to our patients and our community. And we have a, a very uh, sophisticated inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation program at Grace Cottage, providing over 16,000 outpatient treatments a year and over 25,000 inpatient and swing patient uh, uh, services uh, by our, our rehabilitation team at Grace Cottage. Uh, we have a rural health clinic. I think we're really quite well known for, for rural health care. Um, we're one of the few organizations that I'm familiar with that I've worked at uh, that really focuses on the health and wellness of our constituents, our patients in our community, rather than uh, in driving volume and uh, interactions and billable services. Uh, we do everything possible at Grace Cottage to actually keep people out of the hospital. Uh, and we believe, I personally believe, and I believe my team also shares the, uh, the belief that uh, primary care is really uh, the, the most important uh, solution to fixing uh, our national problem of, of continuously increasing health care costs in this country. Uh, making people healthier and keeping them out of the hospital is really the only way that we're going to drive down the cost of care in, in the United States. And every day of the year, Grace Cottage works tirelessly to improve the health and well-being of the patients that rely on us uh, by providing them access to primary care providers, uh, providing them access to an emergency department that could link them to a primary care provider once the acute episode is resolved, and by making sure that our patients 
are doing everything possible to manage their chronic healthcare issues like hypertension and diabetes and obesity and uh, mental health uh, and doing everything possible to, to be healthy and to stay out of the hospital and to stay out of the emergency department. Uh, we also have a community health team with two FTEs who provide services free of charge to our community members. Um, and we have um, uh, two uh, uh, advanced practice providers who provide behavioral health services to our constituents as well. Uh, and in, in addition, we have a, a retail pharmacy right here on our campus that does a very brisk business of helping our, our patients have access to getting their prescriptions filled uh, so that they can continue to, to do the things necessary to control their, their cholesterol and their, their chronic health uh, care issues without, without having to, to deal with, uh, with long distance travel to a commercial pharmacy in, uh, in Brattleboro or in New Hampshire. Um, what, this, this year, we're, we're really pleased. Uh, I, I think all of you know that uh, the town of Brattleboro uh, has an annual, um, uh, the Brattleboro Reformer, rather, has a, a Reader's Choice uh, survey that they conduct uh, here in the region where people who live in this part of the, of the, the state are able to, um, to vote on uh, the services that they feel uh, are the best in the region. Uh, it's the Reader's Choice Award. Uh, and in 2020, Grace Cottage won uh, every healthcare award uh, available to us uh, to win, uh, including best hospital, best emergency department, best physical therapy, best pharmacy, best doctor and best pediatrician, as well as the best place to work. Um, I think that really says a lot about Grace Cottage and about the, uh, the level of, of, of service, the level of um, uh, dedication and commitment we, we have to uh, meeting the needs of the people that rely on us for their health care. So a little feather in our cap at Grace Cottage for, for being so well thought of by uh, our community and the people that, uh, that use us on a daily basis for their, for their care. Our next slide talks about hospital uh, mission. Uh, our mission is to serve the healthcare needs of our community, to promote wellness, to relieve suffering, and to restore health. I think all of those attributes uh, were covered in my earlier comments this morning. Uh, next slide uh, talks about our vision. Um, we're dedicated to providing personalized, competent, and, and accessible primary care, rehabilitation, wellness, prevention, inpatient care, and emergency services. Uh, we really focus on preventive care, as I mentioned earlier, about keeping people healthy, uh, about prolonging the well-being of our community. Uh, we collaborate with other healthcare organizations in the region, hospitals uh, that are that have more that are more full-service organizations than Grace Cottage, and uh, we work very closely with organizations like Dartmouth Hitchcock, with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, with Cheshire Medical Center across the the state line close to us in New Hampshire. Uh, we embrace, uh, 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 our community embraces Grace Cottage as a welcoming resource for health and wellness, and the diversity and culture of our region uh, will be reflected in all that we do. We're working very diligently on expanding our diversity and our ability to provide services to a diverse uh, and ever-changing cultural uh, community that we, we provide services to. Um, I want to turn it over now to uh, Stephen Brown, uh, our chief financial officer. Uh, he's going to go over the, the income statement, the balance sheet, and review our cash flow statement, and then we can go into some specific discussion about our financial uh, plan for the coming uh, fiscal year 2021. Stephen? So our fiscal year 21 net patient revenue budget is based on um, primarily on volumes experienced during the first five months of fiscal year 2020 from October through February prior to the pandemic with no additional growth projected beyond the trends that we're showing in various service lines. Um, 
for instance, it, emergency department was trending up through all of those months, and we expected that that trend continued. Didn't uh, didn't budget further growth beyond that, but based it on what was showing during those times. Um, we had experienced growth in some areas, particularly in primary care, as a result of providers, relatively newly hired providers, maturing as the last fiscal year ended, the beginning fiscal year started, those practices becoming full. Um, so that's what the projection going forward for fiscal year 21 is based upon. I included in the presentation slides the income statement as well as a, the balance sheet and the cash flow primarily as reference points. I'm not going to read through them line for, by line be, since you all have them. Um, the income statement is a very high level summary of an extremely detailed budget that was built from the bottom up based on extensive discussions and evaluation and truthfully best guess estimates of what might happen next year by each individual department, um, you know, forecast, trying to forecast what may or may not happen, whether there are no more government shutdowns or no more large outbreaks of COVID. Um, it's extremely, Unpredict, you know, impossible to predict, I guess, as everybody is well aware. Um, but we used our best um, judgment to come up with where we thought we would be from a revenue standpoint and the associated expense standpoint. We did a really good job of trying to maintain an expense level that was really not a lot different than what was budgeted in 2020. Um, it is certainly higher, of course, than 2020 projection, um, but 2021, 2020 projection would have been higher had volumes continued throughout the whole year. The next page, the balance sheet is again, a very high level um, snapshot of where we're at. Um, where our position is, it separates out our COVID funding sources that we will have left at the end of 2020, as well as where we believe we will be at the end of 2021. We were, which I'll talk about in a moment when we get to the slide that talks about COVID funding. We were very fortunate um, to have received hopefully what is more than adequate funding to get us through the crisis, even if it lasts through all of next year and into the next one. Um, cash flow statement I included um, simply to show where some of those sources of funding were coming from and going. Our overall change in charge request, what we're requesting for a rate increase for the coming year is 3.2%. Um, we felt that we needed to ask for at least that much in part to keep our charge requests in some areas above what hopefully inflationary requests will be. In many cases, as we've talked about every year in the past, the majority of our um, reimbursement is cost-based reimbursement as a critical access and rural health clinic particularly all of Medicare, and that rate request doesn't really affect that reimbursement much on the bottom line, actually doesn't really affect it at all. Where it affects are the things that are paid on fee schedules, and if, you, if you're fortunate enough that a particular insurance company increases their fee schedule from one year to the next, by you need to at least increase your rates enough to get cover that because they aren't going to pay more, you more than what you're requesting. Um, not that I am ever hopeful that any of them will increase at 3.2%. Um, I will turn it now back over to Doug to talk about service lines and any changes in the facility. 
So uh, we, we have no immediate plans, uh, either short term or, or, or next year, to, to make any major service line adjustments. Um, we um, obviously are focused on, uh, on risks and opportunities, which is the next slide. Uh, clearly, the biggest risk to us um, uh, is, is what, what could potentially happen with the pandemic. Um, we've been very fortunate. We've, we've tested over 1,000, almost 1,100 patients here at Grace Cottage for COVID-19. Uh, we've had, uh, I believe, 12 positive patients out of uh, that total number tested. Uh, and only one, patient, one of those 12 patients actually died from the disease. Everybody, the, other, the other patients were able to go home and recover without uh, any complications. So we've been really fortunate. Um, uh, in, in the fact that the disease has, has, has not been as, as damaging to the local community and to our employees as it has been in other parts of the state and other parts of the country. But that, that still doesn't, uh, doesn't tell us what, what could happen in the coming months. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, about disease uh, escalation, you know, as we get into the into the you know, flu season, uh, the influenza season, we don't know how COVID is going to react during the, the the winter months when things get cold again and people um, uh, gravitate back indoors, which is where the disease tends to spread most effectively. Uh, so we're not going to let our guard down. Uh, we've changed a lot of things operationally at Grace Cottage to ensure that our patients and our employees stay safe. Uh, things like PPE and screening and uh, visitation policies and things of that nature. We're going to continue those efforts and we're going to follow the, the advice of the, of the health department and the governor as we uh, move forward in managing COVID here locally and at Grace Cottage. But it's certainly a risk, uh, and I think it's going to have an impact on uh, how people view health care. We've seen, uh, by virtue of the fact that so many patients, at least early on, were, were um, uh, more interested in, in non-contact uh, consultation with their providers than face-to-face -face visits. Uh, and we believe that's going to continue for a while. People are going to uh, continue to, to be somewhat reluctant to, to go into hospitals, to go into the provider office. So we continue to, uh, to tout the message to our patients that it's safe to come to Grace Cottage and that it's really, really important not to ignore your health care issues, not to ignore your symptoms. Don't put off your care. Um, if, you feel, if you're not feeling well, make sure you reach out at least by, by telephone and give us an opportunity to guide you on the best course of treatment to deal with your specific problem. The other risk, of course, is, is Medicaid. Uh, it's been a risk for since, you know, for 40 some, for, you know, since 1947 at Grace Cottage, so that since we when we opened, it's gonna continue to be a problem going forward. Uh, you know, Medicaid expansion is something we feel strongly about. I think a lot of hospitals in Vermont feel strongly about expanding access to patients who are struggling financially, who don't have health care insurance, who need Medicaid to, uh, to gain access to care. Um, again, keeping people healthy is the way to lower the cost of care in the state of Vermont and across the country. And the only, only way to do that is to make sure that as many people as possible have access to particularly primary care, if anything else. But we can't continue to expand access to Medicaid uh, while reimbursing healthcare organizations at a level less than half of what it costs to provide the, the actual care. Uh, and so expanding Medicaid access uh, is important for the health of our communities, but it also creates increasing uh, burden on healthcare organizations like Grace Cottage to figure out how to, to, to pay for the care to, to pay for the cost of the care and to um, keep our doors open and keep the lights on. You've heard that expression earlier today from the Rutland presentation. So those are the two biggest risks that we have our eye on right now. Uh, with regard to opportunities, um, expanding access to primary care. 
It's one of the most important things we focus on at Grace Cottage. It's instrumental, instrumental in uh, our mission and vision for the future. We believe it's what, it, what, it's what makes Grace, Grace Cottage the, the, the phenomenal organization that it is. Um, and we want to continue to provide access to primary care. So uh, making sure that people uh, get appointments quickly. Uh, in many cases now, uh, same day appointments are available at Grace Cottage almost every single day. And we're going to continue to build upon that access uh, going forward into the future and into next year. Uh, we're also taking advantage of an opportunity in the local uh, area with the uh, unraveling of a, of a very busy pediatric practice in Brattleboro uh, and the loss of pediatric providers in the region. We just took on an advanced practice provider in pediatrics to join our, uh, our pediatric physician to create a two-provider pediatric office to increase access to care for uh, pediatric patients here at Grace Cottage. We, and we're, we're really uh, impressed at the number of patients, uh, families who are contacting us even before this new provider has uh, hit boots on the ground, uh, asking how they can, can get an appointment and, and can get, in, get onto the schedule in the very near future. So it looks to, be, to us, even early on, to be a demand for uh, pediatric care here at Grace Cottage, and we're going to build on that that access and the need for for uh, increasing demand for pediatric care. Um, Stephen, you want to say a few things about our capital budget plans for fiscal 21? Sure. Our 21 capital budget includes primarily two large projects, um, both replacement or upgrades of existing equipment. One is the regular every five or six year replacement of our Pixis med stations. And the second is a large IT project, which includes a complete upgrade and refresh of our wireless and physical network for connectivity, which will bring our hopefully our entire IT infrastructure well into the 21st century and position us well for the next several years to effectively use our electronic health record primarily, but everything else involved. Um, and particularly now, the importance of being able to Zoom correctly <laughs> or efficiently and have good connection for that. Um, unfortunately, that's probably not going away anytime soon. Um, we do not have any approved or planned CON projects at this point in time. So at this point, Happy to open things up for questions and, and comments. Kevin, you are on mute. Yeah. You. Uh... A little bit of a delayed reaction on my mute button. Apparently, when you uh, hit it twice, it goes right back. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going to start with board member Lunge. Um, Robin? Sure, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation and all the work that you've been doing in terms of your operational changes in response to COVID. Um, I had a couple questions around embedded assumptions around uh, the Medicare reimbursement. Um, it I know that as a critical access hospital, you are cost-based and that sequestration had made a pretty big difference in terms of um, cost base actually being below cost. So I'm wondering if you've quantified or looked at the impact of the elimination of the sequestration through the end of this year on uh, your 20 budget in the first quarter of 21. So the 2% sequestration, if you look at our net patient revenue of roughly 12 million, Medicare net patient revenue of roughly $12 million amounts to about $250,000 for a year. So what would be included in that three month period going forward is about $62,000. So it's, you know, it's pretty modest it's nice to have, but it doesn't make a huge difference in the bottom line of a, um, 
$20 million budget. Yep. And um, I'm assuming that uh, your Medicaid assumptions were a, a flat rate, no Correct. rate changes. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to get a little bit more information about your telehealth um, implementation, how, you know, what you, if you did tell some telehealth uh, changes in response to COVID and how that's been going? Um, we, we've done a little bit of everything uh, with regard to, to telehealth, uh, uh, but not, but the, 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 the actual, uh, you know, vo volume uh, impact has, has not been all that significant uh, other than, than the loss, you know, the loss revenue initially when we were getting, getting paid for, for non-face-to-face -face, uh, contact with our, with our patients. Uh, we've seen a little bit of relief in that regard. Now we're we're actually getting, you know, paid something for for connecting with patients on a non-face to face basis. But again, you know, everything we do is primary care. So, uh, you know, telehealth with you know with other organizations for specialty and subspecialty services, uh, not very robust in in Southern Vermont at the present time, um, and probably not going to be very robust going forward because. Uh, you know, it, it's it's very difficult to rely on specialists and subspecialists to provide you with with telehealth consultations when uh, when the cost to them to do so and the lack of reimbursement makes it uh, financially un, untenable. Uh, so, you know, in, until there is a national solution on how to reimburse uh, not only the 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 organizations that have the patients uh, in front of them, but the, the specialists who are on the other end of the, the technology chain uh, to, to make you know, telehealth a, a, an economically viable solution to expanding access to care. Um, there's not going to be a lot of appetite for expanding you know, telehealth uh, you know, anytime soon, at least from what I'm saying. That's interesting because actually in other parts of the state, we have seen a very robust expansion of telehealth, in particular in primary care, um, in terms of uh, it replacing face a lot of face-to-face -face visits. Um, so it's just interesting that that pattern is not necessarily uh, reflected in your situation. We did reckon during the initial, you know, the, during the shutdown period particularly, we did use a lot of telehealth in primary care um, for primary uh, for basically necessary visits. Uh, you know, most of our patients we did it for anything that they thought they absolutely had to have. Um, it was difficult in part to make it very widespread because um, connectivity in this area for video ones particularly is quite limited. Um, getting good connectivity outside of downtown areas in the towns we serve can be very difficult. So a lot of them were, you know, they relied on telephone visits, which yeah. can only go so far. So yeah. Yeah, yes, we did do a fair amount of it, but it, you know, as soon as people were able to start actually coming back to the doctor's office, that's what is happening um, because it's just not a substitute. Yeah, just just to clarify, my, my comments around telehealth were really the non non telephone related you know interactions, you know, uh, Zoom, FaceTime, uh, things of that nature, where where you know uh, screen where you can you know visibly you know the patient can see the provider and the provider can see the patient. Uh, but Stephen's right. We you know we 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 had a lot of telephone calls early on from patients who you know. Were concerned about their health and really didn't know what to do. Uh, should I go to the emergency room? You know, should I speak? To, you know, should I speak to my doctor? Can I speak to my doctor? Can I talk to a nurse? Can I get some advice on, on where to go to deal with this problem? So, had a lot of that, and we and we provided a lot of that that care by telephone, and, and really weren't getting paid for it. Okay, uh, that's also interesting because my understanding is that the BISH, the uh, Department of Financial Regulation order requires commercial reimbursement. So I don't know if it's out of state uh, insurers that you're uh, referring to, but certainly in Vermont, telephone visits were being reimbursed. 
Not at the level, though, of a face-to-face -face encounter, always. Sometimes, you're right, some of them were. Thanks. Um, uh, so the other question I had about um, the... Oh, we have someone who is not on mute. I think it might be George Terwilliger. So if you could please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, uh, in terms of the net patient revenue assumptions, um, looking at the first five months, I was curious if those assumptions also factor in the new uh, pediatrician provider or, or how you factored that into NPR, if at all. For the year going forward, generally providers are budgeted um, at the level they are at, are at. So I look at each individual provider, what they've been doing, what they would do going forward. In the case of the pediatrician, that is a whole new position. So yes, I make an assumption of what I think in the coming year she will be producing from a net patient revenue standpoint. But from a volume standpoint, each individual provider is more or less expected to continue the volume that they were doing in those first five months. Got it. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have for questions. Thank you very much, Robin. Next, we're going to move to member Pelham. Tom? Good. Thank you. I am almost instinctively, uh, when it comes to Leland and Grain Townsend, want to say, go Eagles, beat Rebels. But uh, <laughs> that, was long ago. <laughs> that was long ago and far away. Um, so my, my first question um, is, you say in the narrative that both Medicaid and commercial uh, relative rate uh, changes in charge uh, has little effect um, as long as our charges are higher than the fee schedule when it comes to Medicaid and commercial. And so I'm just wondering whether um, the 3.2 percent increase, uh, requested increase in charge uh, leaves anything on the table in terms of commercial and Medicaid um, relative to your commercial Medicaid fee schedules? Um, or is, in other words, uh, <clears throat> would a higher change in charge um, um, result in, 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 in more revenue or, re the, or have you maxed out with, with a 3.2% increase in charge? Uh, a higher rate increase would make a small difference on a small part of our business. So for those pretty essentially all of Medicaid is on a fee schedule. So you're only going to get paid what they decide to pay us on that fee schedule and what we charge doesn't matter. On the commercials, for instance, Blue Cross Blue Shield, we get paid on, for outpatient services on a fee schedule for laboratory and diagnostic imaging services. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what I charge as long as I'm charging more than what that individual fee schedule for an individual test is. Where it does make a difference is on the rest of, for instance, Blue Cross, the rest of outpatient services, as well as all of our inpatient services are paid on a percent of charges. And several, some of the other commercial insurers as well, usually all inpatient and most outpatient are also paid on a percent of charges. So yes, the more I charge, the higher they're going to pay me. But they also, we negotiate contracts, for instance, with Blue Cross each year. And the more I, increase my rates, the more they want to increase their discount and therefore reducing the percentage that they charge. So it's a fine line how much of it I'll end up actually getting. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm, I mean, it looks from your balance sheet that uh, this CARES money has been quite helpful. And it looks like, yes. like about $4 million there that seems to be uh, you know, will be there over time and, and not have to be spent. So what I'm just curious as to what is your view of this one time money that's enhanced your balance sheet going forward in terms of trying to save it and and use it as a, an investment or to spend it down slowly? Um, what's your thought about that money? 
So just quickly, um, I meant to talk about that sooner and I never did. I was real, forgot that it was the in the budget submission that had the slide about um, funding sources rather than our presentation. So if you had recall from looking at our budget presentation, we essentially at the beginning back in April and May got roughly $10 million of cash coming into the facility about $3 million in Medicare advance funding, which of course is strictly a loan, a $3 million payroll protection loan, um, some of which will be forgiven, and about $4.3 million in CARES Act stimulus money. As of projection at the end of um, this current year, we, well, let me back up one second. The $3 million worth of Medicare money, they're going to start deducting very soon, and we fully plan to return all of that money um, and have not spent any of it. The remaining money, the payroll protection loan and the CARES fund money, we will have used, as of the end of 2020, roughly only about $2.5 million of that money. And assuming we use the $800,000 in the 21 budget that I put on that line, at the end of 21, we're still going to have about $3.7 million left over. Um, I don't honestly know as of today how long we're going to be able to keep that money. I mean, based on the last thing I read a couple of weeks ago, the current plan is that you have to have spent all of that money by next June or July, I believe it is, or return it. Um, fortunately, the, we have got all of the money still sitting in the bank that we cannot justify having spent for COVID-related loss in revenues or COVID-related expenses. We're not just spending the money on things that are not COVID related because you have to justify to the federal government for the CARES money what you spent that money on. Um, so, you know, we're fortunately in a comfortable position right now that we still have more than enough money to cover any revenue shortfalls related to lack of volume due to patients not coming in here due to the COVID crisis and or increased expenses related to um, such as some of the things Doug referred to, you know, that we've added full-time screening positions to screen patients coming into the building. We've had, had to remodel um, or working on remodeling registration areas for that purpose. Um, additional positions in areas such as housekeeping and places like that due to the extra work involved um, of course, PPE going, spending a lot more money on that. Um, but at this point, as far as we can foresee, we will have plenty of COVID funding available to cover any of those increased costs or reduced revenues. Thank you. Um Another area, and this just could be, you know, the issue having to do with your size and small numbers, but I was looking at your uh, growth in bad debt and free care, first by 88% and the second by uh, 34%, and the statewide averages across all hospitals, which is a huge number in the billions, uh, is at 12% and 14.6%. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your increase in bad debt and free care and and what and uh, what's behind that. Um, you know, we fortunately have a relatively low percentage of gross revenue to start with as a write off percentage. Um, you know, I think truthfully what happens has happened is people are making choices who to pay and, you know, we're not high on that list of people that are going to stop providing them service if we they don't pay their bills. If they don't pay their fuel bill, they're not going to get fuel. 
If they don't pay their Grace Cottage hospital bill, we're still going to take care of them every time they walk in the door, whether it be an emergency room visit for primary care or needed lab or x-ray done. So I think it's simply our community and our community knowing that we're near, we're here when they need us. And we, although we'd like to get paid, we don't force them to pay, um, which is probably also one of the reasons that our community is also so um, generous to us. Well, speaking of that, when I was down there, you um, you talked to me a little bit about the finance committee that you have and that there are a lot of uh, um, second homeowners on that finance committee, um, mm -hmm. given that you have all these second homeowners down there and they want to have a, a hospital that's up and running to right. their uh, to their standards. And so I'm just wondering, with this COVID um, event um, <clears throat> over the first part of the year, what what have you seen in terms of uh, the second homeowners and their support for the hospital and um, and their comfortableness or their inclination to spend more time in Vermont? Um, from what I can tell, all of our second homeowners are now primarily primary homeowners. Uh, I think pretty much every second home in the area is has been occupied since March. I don't know if there's any current plan for any of them to leave. Um, truthfully, there are, you know, you go down to the local grocery store and there's as many non-Vermont cars as there are Vermont cars in the parking lot. And it's not Although there's still plenty of people coming to visit, it's not just people coming to visit. It's the people that are here. Um, and they have continued to be extremely generous. Even you know during this, um, our foundation truthfully was shocked at the generosity of donors, specifically during such a difficult time when some of those donors, you know, were probably thinking, should I spend my money because the stock market's so down so far? Um, but they've continued to show their support. So, okay. And my final question is, um, you, in terms of uh, <clears throat> overall NPR, you folks are seven-tenths of one percent. I mean, you are very small. Correct. And um, you've also the only hospital that over the period up to 20 or through 2019 had negative operating margins all five years. There's no other other hospital that's been in that circumstance. And so I'm just wondering if you have any advice for us at the Green Mountain Care Board, how we can better support um, a small hospital like you. Um, uh, is, are the things that we can do that, uh, that, that, that can help you strengthen your financial structure over the long run, especially if this one-time COVID money kind of goes away and you have to pay it back at some point in time. Um, so it's just a kind of an open-ended question. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, Doug already touched upon it as our, and our biggest risk. And truthfully, the main reason for us not being able to achieve a positive bottom line is the abysmal Medicaid reimbursement and the fact that this tiny facility contributes almost $2 million a year to the state of Vermont Medicaid fund. I sadly know that you don't really have any control over that, but that is the bottom line. I mean, it, continuing to essentially write a check to the state of Vermont every year for $2 million, this facility, I don't think truthfully can ever have a positive bottom line. Well, on that note, I'll, I'll pass the baton. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, uh, anyway, yes. Thank you, Tom. Now we're going to move to member Yusufer. Maureen? Uh, thanks. Um, I'm actually going to take a little different take on what, what Tom was just talking about. Um, you have had negative operating margins for the past five years, and you continue to miss your budget each year. And you know, I know you're small. I know, you know, it's not going to move the needle tremendously. You know, I really want you to be a successful hospital. I think that as we look at your requests for, for this year, it, it's similar to what we went through last year. So 
Last year, you had asked for an 8.7% increase, which we reduced to a 3.5% increase, although the trend would have been looking at much lower than just bringing you to the 3.5. And I remember there was a lot of pushback about the um, how you were going to hit these high numbers. Um, through February to that revised budget, you were tracking that negative 6.8%. And as we look forward to what you're forecasting for 20 for next year, if I just take you at, you're, you're going to go at the same rate that you were at this year, which was at the minus 6.8%, you would come out to be about $18.6 million, which is about where you've been for the past several years. Um, your forecast this year has your fourth quarter up, projected up 12% from where you were a year ago. Uh, so, so one question maybe to help me feel comfortable that you can achieve these numbers would be, do we know where we were running through July the month for the fourth quarter? Were you up significantly? And I really want to get the point that the concern here is your expenses are built on achieving a budget of $21 million dollars and you're spending $22 million, uh, $22.8 million is your projection. And should you come in around $18.6 or $19 million, um, which was the push we had last year, um, your expenses are going to be quite out of line and you lose a lot of money. So I'm just you know, trying to understand how you're going to get this potential growth again that you're forecasting. Um, and yes, you're small, it's not gonna move the needle, it's more for the health of the hospital. Because if you end up coming in around 19 million, you would eat into that CARES money pretty quickly, but as you've said, you're probably gonna have to return a bit of that because it wasn't for loss volume. So just trying to get a comfort on your NPR forecast as it relates to you being down 8% for the first five months of the year to the revised budget and then projecting significantly up in the fourth quarter. A lot of the, you're right, being small is is difficult in a lot of ways, but one of the issues with it is it take, doesn't take much of a change in a specific line of business to make a big swing. Um, and part of that is in what we're doing for business. Um, to give you an idea, as an average for outpatient revenue for the hospital, we collect, give or take, 50% of what we bill. For the inpatient side of the service, acute and or swing patients, we collect more like 85 to 90% of what we bill. So it doesn't take a very big swing or flux in inpatient volume of collecting a lot more of what you're actually charging to offset even a small decrease in outpatient volume because you're only collecting half of what you're charging. And we have been, um, as Doug said, our patient census has been up this year and particularly, truthfully, since not so much during the true shutdown period of COVID, March and April, but since then, we've been busier on average than we normally are in the inpatient unit. Um, no COVID-related admissions, but we've had more acute patients and days than normal. We've had a lot of swing bed patient days. Um, this past week, on I think it was Thursday, we had a six or eight people trying to get in here to be swing bed patients and we didn't have space for them. Um, so that's where kind of the projections are going. Yes, as a total gross patient volume, it doesn't necessarily change a lot. The net patient collection is very different depending on what you're doing for service. And I hear you about expenses. Um, well, you, you appears that the expenses are built on a particular volume. They're really, the majority of our expenses are fixed. Um, whether we're projecting a million dollars worth of diagnostic imaging revenue or $500,000 worth of diagnostic imaging revenue, 
I still need the same amount of staffing because I have minimum staffing levels in most of those departments, diagnostic imaging, laboratory, they're all, in order to keep the doors open, the emergency department is a perfect example. I have to staff the emergency department with a 24 seven provider and nurse, whether I've got one or two patients, which is exactly what we had a day during part of the period of the COVID. There were days we only had one or two patients, or I've got 25 patients. Um, they, those same two people still take care of all of them. Um, so we daily try to keep our expenses as low as possible, and they're all tied to the volume we're doing. And a, and a small change in volume does not increase or decrease the cost of our running this facility. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I, I'm going to need and more. I hear, more I hear you. Care. And I'm, and truthfully, you've, you're only looking at five years, not to make this sound good, but I have been here far too long, 36 years, I guess it is now. And I can remember one year out of 36 years that we had a positive operating margin. John, I, I appreciate that your community really helps out. I'm just, you know, in, in 2018, you were at 18.2 million, 19, you were at 18.7 million, 20, if I were to track where you were for down 7% through the five months, you would have been about 18.4, you know, and then now asking for the, the 21 million. I mean, um, and one and thing that has just made, the question on July, do we right. know, you know, to make me feel more comfortable in July, do you know roughly how far ahead you were uh, a year ago? Or can you get back to us on an I, NPR? I, I, could, I could get back to you. I've, this week, as soon as we're done today, need to try and do the July financial reports because honestly, they haven't um, haven't had time getting working on the budget to do those. Um, but the other thing that speaking a little bit, um, Earlier in Rutland's presentation, Judy mentioned revenue cycle, and we've actually that is actually accounts for a little bit of the revenue increase, net patient revenue increase as well. We have a new um, director of billing that's been here now a year plus, and has spent a lot of time assuring that we're actually getting paid for every service we provide. The emergency department is a good example. Whereas, you know, rather than just if you come into the emergency room rather than just billing a facility fee and a provider fee, if you have specific procedures and things done that insurance companies pay for, they're now billing for all of those. The, we were providing the care, we just weren't always billing every dollar that you could bill for and get paid for. Um, not that there's a lot of that, but that contributes to the bottom line as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to keep, I uh, just, you know, last yeah. year when we brought it down, the point back was, oh, we're going to have to cut services in order to get to the reduced number that we gave you. That's not the intent. The intent is, right. we and we said, no, don't cut any services. If you can really get to that we, number, we get to that number. Right. But it just doesn't look, again, like you're going to get to the numbers that you're putting forward. And you, again, you were trending down for the first five months of the year significantly, 7% on a budget that we reduced by 5%. So, and it, the whole point is to try to make sure you can be around and be sustainable. It's, you know, it's, you're not gonna get it obviously from commercial rate is, is a small ask and it's a small contribution because of your payer mix. So um, I think I got my point across, but um, yes. at least like to I get agree. July where you are cause you're tracking that you're gonna be 12% ahead for the fourth okay. quarter of the prior year. All right. uh, so if July is not tracking well ahead, you're going to miss the fourth quarter. Okay, thanks. Okay, next we're going to go to uh, Member Holmes. Jessica? Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks for the presentation. I'm not going to belabor Maureen's point, but a couple of things I just want to suggest about the NPR. Um, one is we just heard from another hospital that their revenue predictions are down because of the social distancing and the disinfectant that has to happen in between patients. And so that reduces productivity. Um, so I think that's one concern in sort of assuming a return to pre-COVID volumes is simply like, do you have the capacity and the productivity availability to do that? And the second concern I would say is um, the second homeowner, right? A lot of 
that have chosen to I'm stay. Sorry. I'm sorry, Jessica, you, you cut out. There was some yeah. background noise there. Oh, okay. Uh, the second concern, if you could just start that over. Sure. The second concern I have, and it's, I don't, it's not volume for me, it's not background noise here, so I don't know if somebody's not on mute. No, you're cutting out. I don't, I, we, we can't, couldn't hear you either, but it sounded like your connection was cutting out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. My second concern is just that if second homeowners who have stayed through the, uh, you know, the isolation and the quarantine, you know, next year in 2021 return to their primary homes, that's another reason why volumes may also decline. So those are two concerns that I have um, about the projections for, you know, returning to pre-COVID uh, right. revenue. I don't want to belabor it. We've talked about it enough. I'm just gonna. If you have, if you have an answer that's great or a thought about that, that's great. I don't want to belabor it too much. While while they may be included in the projected amount for the month of July, August, September, they really were not included in the budgeted amount going forward because, as I said, the budgeted amount was based on volumes in October through February. Okay. Um, so they weren't here to start with. Fair um, and I, yeah, and honestly, like I said, in October through February, emergency department, for instance, was continuing to trend up. Although those people might be have coming at the moment to the emergency department because they don't have primary care providers here. I truthfully don't think we have huge amounts of business at the moment from the secondary homeowners being in the area. Okay. Um, and actually, so, you know, the, the emergency room was interesting to me. And you staff a 24-7 emergency room. Correct. It sounds like you have about seven to eight patients a day on average, right? If that is that. correct. Yep. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, at what point of patient level do you say this is just not cost effective? I know you're critical access hospital. I know there's cost plus reimbursement. But at what point, given that Brattleboro is 25 minutes to the south and Springfield is, what, 40 minutes to the north, at what point does it just become cost ineffective to fully staff or, you know, have two providers, as you said, 24-7 for such a small patient count? It became cost ineffective many, many years ago. Um, but the, to, if we choose not to staff an emergency room 24-7, that would be making the decision not to be a critical access hospital because that is a requirement of a critical access hospital is to have a, an emergency room 24-7. Right. And have you explored other designations? Um, we used to be a regular PPS hospital. Um, I'm not sure if there are designations as a hospital that you can continue doing what we do, acute and swing, which are important to the facility, and also not have an emergency department. And, and I just on that note, however, um, truthfully, the emergency department, having the emergency department is one of the reasons that our community, or our, the primary reason that the large dollar volume comes in from fundraising of that $1 million we get a year, give or take, um, from those second homeowners that want the emergency department here. And you are correct that Brattleboro is only 17 miles south of us. However, many of the patients that are coming to our emergency department live 42 minutes to an hour north or northwest of us. Um, if you happen to look at a map and see where we are located, Springfield is a good 40 minute drive to the northeast. Rutland is an hour and 10 or minutes more to the more or less north, slightly northwest. And then you've got Bennington an hour plus, you know, the other direction. So there's a huge, huge area of people that have already traveled 45 minutes or more to get here and would have to travel another half hour to get that 17 miles to Brattleboro, which is about what it takes. And I know that from experience because during my early years here, I spent six years driving our volunteer ambulance service that we had at the time. And it's a long way trying to get to an emergency room. Okay. Um, I guess my last question in the interest of time is um, you didn't answer the healthcare advocates question about the average commercial reimbursement to Medicare reimbursement because you claimed that you couldn't calculate it by individual payer. Um, just for completion of your submission, if you could 
follow up with uh, at least to the hospital budget team, the average commercial, so not by payer, but across all payers, commercial to Medicare reimbursement, that would be helpful. Okay. That's it for Thank me. you, Jess. Um, Steve, in a perfect world, what would be the uh, percentage of your PPP loan that you would hope to be forgiven? Um, when I did the budget submission, I was looking at probably 65 to 75% of it being forgiven. Um, truthfully, we've actually just started looking at that. Um, with the expand, the change they made to the number of weeks of payroll that you could include now, I'm hopefully optimistic that we actually might get the entire thing forgiven. That would be great. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher. Mike? Let me un unmute myself. <laughs> um, let me just say thank you, Jess, for your question about, um, about our question. Um, and with that, we have no other questions for Grace Cottage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. At this point, we're going to open it up to public comment. Would anyone like to issue a public comment on Grace Cottage's budget submission? Okay, that was uh, very short and sweet. And actually, we are now ahead of schedule, if you can believe it.